Uh, like Chris mentioned, my name is Brian Pauley. I'm with Game Fish and Parks. And I'm one of the private lands biologists that helps cover this area of the state. Uh, Matt Grunig is another one. And between the two of us, we cover the eastern half of the state. So uh, I'm just going to talk to you guys. I'm going to start to get into some of the program stuff that, uh, that Chris and, and uh, Carrie were, were talking about here. So uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully I'm not moving too fast for you guys. But um, the reason we, we do a lot of these workshops and, and the reason that we're uh, real adamant about working with our private landowners is that 80% of South Dakota is, is privately owned. And so we can, we can do as much habitat work as we want to on our public lands, but at the end of the day, you guys as the private land owners have the majority of the wildlife on your property. And so we really rely on you guys to make sure that our, our wildlife are, are in good hands. So the state of South Dakota has a number of different programs that we can use to help you guys out. And our programs are designed to kind of fit in where the federal programs maybe fall short or maybe you don't qualify for a federal tree program, for example. Uh, maybe the state will be able to pick up those acres, maybe we won't, but, but that's where our programs really try to fill that void. So just to kind of get into the, the nitty gritty of it here, uh, the state, the, through Game Fish and Parks, we've got a woody habitat program. And just to kind of highlight some of our, our program uh, information here, we can cover up to 75% of your guys' tree planting, uh, up to a maximum of $10,000 per shelter belt. And this is one of our most popular habitat programs. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have the budget to take on a whole lot of tree projects every year. So if this is something you guys are, are considering, uh, definitely get a hold of me or get a hold of, of your local conservation district folks uh, because we do have a waiting list for these projects every year. So um, a couple of the other things that, that have kind of been mentioned before already. Uh, the narrow shelter belts can be wildlife sinks, and so we require a minimum of eight rows, and, and that's to try and build up winter habitat. Uh, and, and our program really focuses on, on the conifers and the shrubs, because ultimately those are the species of trees that get our native wildlife through these tough winters up here. And these are just some pictures of some of our, our woody habitat plantings that have been done in the past. Uh, the picture on the bottom here and the picture in the top right hand corner, uh, you guys can see that those are, those are much more than eight rows. I mean, they, I think the one on the bottom is like 12 and I think the one on the top is like 16 rows. But uh, this planting here is an eight row planting and it, it really shows exactly why we require eight, eight rows. Uh, you can see these, these first three or four rows are completely filled in with snow, um, and it, but it's the back four rows that are actually going to get those wildlife through the tough winters. Uh, one of our favorite projects to kind of put together and work on is to piggyback a few rows uh, through our program along with a CRP planting. And so most oftentimes in the CRP program, they'll allow you guys to plant five rows of trees. And then what we really like to do is use our program to add three or more rows onto that CRP planting. So you guys are kind of getting the best of both worlds there. Um, the CRP payment is gonna be much higher because they'll give you guys a rental rate for their acres over time. Uh, but you're gonna end up with a, a much wider, a much more wildlife beneficial belt in the end. Another real popular program that we've got through the state is our food plot program. And like Chris said, uh, this is probably where landowners really like to play around uh, the most on their property is, is with food plots. So Game Fish and Parks, we offer you guys free seed every spring 
to plant your food plots plus a twenty dollar per acre payment so it's not a lot you're not going to get rich off the payment but it helps cover some of those fuel expenses and things like that um, we don't have have any minimum sizes other than uh, we like to see you guys at least put in an acres worth um, and we always give away corn or sorghum every year and we've started to give it, giving away a brood mix as well uh, these are just a couple couple photos of some food plots out there um, so Chris and I have kind of talked about this whole concept of, of these brood plots and these these brood mixes and we really started pushing this idea about three years ago uh, some of the pheasants forever biologists around the state and and Matt and I we, we got to brainstorming and and we were trying to come up with, with something that we could do uh, to help these younger birds out on the landscape. And ultimately, uh, collaboratively, we, we came up with the idea to, to offer this brood mix through our food plot program. So we played around with the different various mixes for two years before we started giving them away. And ultimately, this is the, the seed mix that we're going to be giving away this year uh, to the landowners. And, and you can see that uh, it's, it's a 10 or, or 11 species mix. Uh, it's made up of cover crops. So these things are, are readily available at most seed dealers. Um, they're annuals, so they've got to be planted every year just like any other food plot would be. Uh, but they, they work really well and, and the mix that we've got uh, will actually flower all summer long and into the fall. So just some, some different pictures of these brood plot mixes because they're, they're so new we get a lot of questions about them and I'm just going to show you guys some pictures from last year's mix uh, from around the state. So this is a picture in Mitchell uh, and notice the June 9th date that this picture was taken. This was a private landowner who, who put in this plot. The third week in June is our peak hatch date for pheasants in South Dakota. And so if we can get flowers and flowering plants on the ground by the third week in June, that's gonna be the most beneficial for these young birds. So June 9th, this is what this plot looked like. It, it's barely coming up. I think it's maybe about three inches high. 20 days later, this same plot uh, is in full bloom and it's leafed out. And, and this is ideal cover if you're a young pheasant chick, uh, not only trying to find food, but also trying to hide from predators. Uh, at this point in time, this plot was about a foot and a half tall, uh, which is adequate enough to hide a pheasant chick and, and a hen as well. So this is a picture from the clear southwest portion of South Dakota out in the, at the Hill Ranch, uh, which is in Fall River County, I do believe. Um, again, on June 10th, you can see it's, it's just starting to come up. It's just starting to flower. Uh, it's a little further along because it was planted a little bit earlier that far west, but um, you can see the dry, sandy soil that it's in, and this stuff is still growing gangbusters out there. So this is only a, a week later and you can see how it really just kicked off and, and it's really just flowering. So Horgan GPA, this is south of Huron. Uh, and again, middle of June, you can see it's, it's flowering. This was much taller. It was probably as tall as this table, maybe waist high, somewhere in there. Um, it was planted a little bit earlier again, so you can see it's just a little further along. So this is a grazing stick that's out there and it, it really just kind of shows you guys how tall that is. Um, and this is a top-down view of the plot. So from the previous picture, it looks like it's just this monoculture of, of mustard, which is what's flowering in the picture. But from a top-down view, you can actually see that there's, there's a real high diversity out there in this stuff. Uh, and if you're a hawk flying over this thing, it's going to be real tough for you guys or for uh, any kind of predator to pick out a pheasant chick, let alone try and catch it in this stuff. 
At ground level, like Chris mentioned, you want to have open travel corridors for these things. And so this is just a picture at ground level. And you can see how there's all this dark open space in there. Uh, again, if you're a pheasant, it's easy to move through this stuff. And ultimately, these brood plot mixes are all about insect production. And uh, when Matt and I were out in this plot, we were absolutely surrounded by bees out there. Um, and so these things are, are dynamite places for bees. Um, we actually drove around looking for the nearest beehive and it was on the next section over, uh, over a mile away was the nearest stack of hives that we could find. So these things were traveling a mile or more just to get to the brood plot. Another picture of a private landowner standing out in his plot. Uh, that's just outside of Brookings. Um, so this guy planted it and, and he called me um, and actually texted me the, these pictures, but he said um, the geese had been walking up and, and feeding on this stuff. And he was a little bit concerned that they were just going to graze it all out. Um, and ultimately what happened was it actually grew fast enough that it grew faster than the geese could keep it chewed off. And so I know, you know, in this northeast part of the state, we have a lot of issues with, with geese eating crop fields. And, and I don't know, I'm not endorsing this as an option. It's just something that happened in, in one case where um, putting in one of these brood plots next to the water actually alleviated this guy's goose problem. So um, maybe there's an opportunity there in the future, maybe there isn't. Um, so in this picture, this is actually in Spink County, Sam Fryman actually sent me this one and it's, it's one of my favorites because it shows the brood plot next to a corn plot. And, and it really just gives you guys a firsthand glimpse into the value of these brood mixes versus your traditional corn plot. Uh, if you're an insect, you can just see that you, you'd be making a living out in this brood mix and, and there's really no value to that corn plot if you're an insect. And, and if there's no insects there, you can't raise a pheasant chick because for the first six to eight weeks of a pheasant chick's life, they exclusively eat insects. So, um, you know, a, a young bird could go out into that corn plot, but it's going to be a tough living uh, versus a brood plot like this. As this thing develops over time, this is a picture from Bennett County. Uh, you can start to see some of the sorghums and, and more of the warm season type plants really starting to come on strong. Uh, this is from Day County, this picture here, the end of July. Uh, you can really see the sorghums and the millets. Uh, the blue flower in the picture is flax. Uh, and so again, we're still flowering, we're still attracting insects, but we're starting to put on some of that grain value. As we roll into August, the sunflowers start to open up and, and they're really the big heavy hitter when it comes to flowering uh, in late summer. And then the next question I get is, is, you know, what's the hunting value of these things? Well, this is what it looked like in October of this year out in these plots. Um, this is Horseshoe Lake, which is out in Gerald County. Uh, you can see that there's sorghum, there's some sunflower heads in there, uh, and that stuff's real tall, probably six, eight feet tall, something like that. Um, but it's just a fraction of the mix. And so this is, can be easily walked, easily hunted. Um, great cover at down level or at ground level uh, for those adult birds still. So here's just a collage of, of the, the brood plot pictures that I showed you guys starting in the upper left hand corner and working your way around clockwise. And so with the right mixture of species, you can see just how these things will evolve over time. And, and benefit the birds more so than just a winter plot. And don't get me wrong, you know, we still need our corn plots out there, we still need our sorghum stands to hold up to the winter, um, but these brood mixes are just another alternative. Um, 
They work great for trying to break the Roundup Ready corn cycle and, and get rid of your volunteer corn because I know that's, that's a big issue in food plots that are just corn after corn after corn. Um, you know, dropping in a brood mix for one year is a great way to break that cycle. So, um, and with that, I'm actually going to turn things over to Matt here. You want to take any questions about that stuff? Yeah, yeah, I can do that if anybody's got any questions. Two. Are they planting most of those with no-till drills, or how are they coming in? So, there's kind of two ways to go about it. Um, you can certainly use a no-till drill. Uh, especially if you've got access to a no-till grass drill or something like that that can handle variable seed sizes. Um, otherwise, uh, you can just broadcast them and then lightly disc them in or, or lightly drag them in. Uh, that works really well too. In fact, that, that Horrigan plot, we brought, that's 12 acres, and we broadcast it every year with a, a, four, a spreader on the back of a four-wheeler and then just drag it in. So, um, e either or will definitely work. Yeah? Like, how early can you, do you, did, or like, what day did they plant those? So, around here, you're probably looking at, we, we recommend any time during the month of May, uh, just because it takes about 30 to 40 days for them to start flowering. And so, in order to have flowers on the ground for those, those chicks the third week of June, um, We've planted them the last two years, the first week of May. Uh, there's cool season and warm season species in the mix. Uh, and so the cool season species will, I mean, they'll, they'll handle cold spring weather. They just can't get frost on them once they start germinating. So as soon as we get into the frost free period, you're good to go as far as planting them. A year like this, if we stay like this, Maybe tomorrow. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but I know the, the plot that was out in Fall River County, uh, that was actually planted the first week of April. So just because they were, they were further along. So. Are they thick enough to choke out sandburrs? Sandburrs specifically, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, they are thick enough to choke out most of the weed competition as far as all of it no i mean you're going to have some annual weeds that come in um, but that horrigan plot for example and, and i'm just going to lean on that one because it's close to huron and, and we kind of kept a real close eye on that the last couple years um, that that gpa actually has quite the thistle issue on it and even after planting these brood mixes for two years on the same food plot acres, there's, there still wasn't a thistle problem. So as far as the you know, noxious weeds go, most of your food plot acres that have been Roundup Ready corn for so long, they just don't have the weed bank there for, for say, thistles. Um, but are you gonna get some, some lamb's quarter and some velvet leaf and, and, and some of those other annual weeds? Sure, you're probably gonna have a few of them, but you know, following up a brood plot with a Roundup Ready corn the next year, you will eliminate those annual weeds again. So. Well, I saw some pictures, <clears throat> I can't remember exactly because I wasn't real trained in this yet, but someplace where they planted corn and then it got so tall and then they planted either radishes or turnips broadcast over so that would come up under the understory because I know they need, they get by with shade and they, in fact, they need it cooler. Yeah. And that's, um, so traditionally, that's how these cover crop species are used. Um, or, or they're used uh, to say follow up wheat harvest so that out on these, out on these fields, you don't have just vast acres of, of openness. Um, and, and that's part of the reason we, we chose the cover crop species is because they're already being used out on the landscape. They're readily available, they're affordable. Um, but yeah, as far as interseeding some of these things into, say, a corn plot, that's real similar to, to like what Chris was doing. Um, with the right mix of species, you could definitely do that. Um, this particular mix that I was showing you, um, I wouldn't recommend it just because there's so many species in there that wouldn't really do a whole heck of a lot. Uh, but if you had a mix that was mostly just, say, radishes, um, canolas and maybe clovers, something like that. 
You bet. Just aerial seeding that stuff or, or broadcasting it out into existing corn um, could work real well. Yeah, I'd like to see it work in soybeans, maybe so there was something left when they got done harvesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and soybeans are, are a tough one, you know. Um, but yeah, that's, and that's a perfect example of, of how these cover crops have been developed over time is, is so that you don't end up with just that black dirt out there. Um, and you see a lot more of them used, especially in wheat fields, for example. Um, wheat, at least you've got stubble out there, but you've got dirt. Right, yeah, it's, it's wide open. What ratio do that? So the mix we've got is 20 pounds an acre. Uh, and we've... If we're giving it away, we've got it bagged up in one acre bags. Um, we actually, we have a March 1st deadline of ordering that stuff. And so I can certainly get you guys signed up for our food plot program and get you guys corn and sorghum seed this year. Um, but we wouldn't be able to get you guys any of the brood mix until next year. Um, but it's 20 pounds an acre is what this mix is at. Uh, I've seen other cover crop mixes that are closer to 40 pounds an acre, just depending on what species you've got in any particular mix. I think the conservation district can order from no one seed here. Yeah, can give me so it's like actually, yeah, if you guys really want it, um, we get it from Millbourne Seeds, and so the local conservation districts can order it for you, or you guys can order it directly from Millbourne Seeds yet. Um, Cost-wise, uh, our mix, if you ordered it directly from Millbourne, is going to cost you about $20 an acre. So if you compare that to a bag of seed corn, which is, a bag of seed corn will do three acres, but it costs you 300 bucks. So you're looking at $100 an acre for, for corn versus $20 an acre for a brood mix like this. Um, so cost-wise, it, it's something to consider as a landowner incorporating um, some of these things into your food plots. Yeah, well, isn't there something that I think the state was doing on some of these food plots when uh, the corn was first coming up and they were planting the deer were coming in and of course filling it off? Didn't they go in and implement like the radishes and stuff like that and that they left the corn alone and let the corn grow and took care of the radishes and so on and so forth? Yeah. Was there, something, was there some experimental done with that? I know the rat meeting they were talking about one time, but that's what they were doing. I know. Um I know like our guys down in our, our Mitchell office do quite a bit with different um, deer plots similar to that um, or, or if they have a, a food plot that maybe fails like in a case where the deer might be chewing it off or, or whatever the case might be. These brood mixes grow so fast and, and a mixture of cover crop species that yeah you can follow up a failed seeding or, or something along those lines with one of these brood mixes. Um, and I know you guys plant quite a few deer plots as well yeah. up in this area. The deer, well, the brew plot kind of acts as a deer plot later in the season. But, you know, it's too planted too late to actually benefit the broods, but it'll sell it off the deer, you know, at that time too. And yeah, we use it to try to bait the deer away from corn at times early in the season or whatever like that. Yeah. That's kind of, you know, one of the reasons, you know, I didn't touch on this, but uh, the Pheasants Forever guys were trying to figure out a, a mixture that they could promote on prevent plant acres out on crop fields. Because you end up with these acres that are just barren uh, that might have been prevent plant. And so that's, that's really what kicked off this idea in the conversation about this was that, yeah, we'll enroll those acres as part of our food plot program. Uh, but why don't we take it a step further and actually develop a mix uh, that could just be planted there in the first place? Um, or like Chris said, if it's not planted until later on, it might not flower, it might not produce seed value, but it's still going to green up and it's still going to be forage. So, not much winter cover. The winter cover, it, it's not going to stand up to the winter weather. You know, and the, the sorghum, the millet. Um, the milos, those are warm season grasses, but um, they're not, you know, they're not big blue stem switchgrass, Indian grass, but so it's not going to hold up to the winter weather, but if we get an open winter like we did this year, these things actually held up fairly well on a year like this. So, and they're dynamite places to hunt the first two weeks to a month of the pheasant season. I mean, 
I can't tell you how many phone calls Matt and I have gotten for guys wanting more of this stuff because that's where they were killing all their birds first couple of weeks. So, um, so yeah, you've been. <laughs> right. Well, it, it's because you know it's because those birds are in there since they're young chicks. You know that's home. Exactly. You know. Seems that's the, the broods that are raised there and eat there and stay there. Come on, season those birds are still in that plot. So you're shooting all those really young roosters out of there. Season, you're shooting all those out of that, that plot. You know, because that's where they they're growing up and fed and spent their entire life basically. So. How do you think it populate without? So I don't think it would do real well at all. There's a few things in there that would try to make a go of it, like the canola would hold over um, the buckwheat, and then the the millet would try and reseed itself. Probably those three more so than anything. Maybe the mustard again. Um, other than that, hardly nothing's going to reseed itself. So uh, it is something that you're going to want to plant every year. When we've done it. If we let it go too long that second year before we got back into it again, the things that show up are uh, we have oats in ours, so it'll be oats and buckwheat. And, yeah. and binding, whatever, yeah. <laughs> but uh, those are the two things that'll receive it so naturally, but the rest of the five isn't anything like it was that first year. They would ro rotate real well with a corn model. Yeah. It works fantastic, you bet. We use it with our corn rotation because you get that volunteer corn issue. So volunteer corn in this brood plot is not an issue. It just grows in there and volunteers all at once and becomes part of the plot. You know, it's not like it's a problem when you're, you know, like it is in a cornfield. Right. It just kind of grows in there. If you go, what I usually recommend to guys is if you've got two food plots, plant one of them to the, the Roundup Ready corn plant the other one to the brood mix, and then flip-flop them every year. And so with the Roundup Ready corn, you're getting weed control on an every other year basis. But with the brood plot, you've got that, that valuable food plot for, for nine months out of the year versus three months, like what the corn's gonna be. And then you're always breaking that, that Roundup Ready corn cycle. So if you just flip-flop your, your food plots, it works fantastic that way. And just like any good farmer is going to rotate their, their crops out in their field, the, anytime you've got the brood plots out there, they're going to add so much nutrient back to the soil. And so um, it, it's like a natural fertilizer going back in there for a year. So. And I'll be around if, if anybody has any more questions or if you want to sign up for our food plot program. Um, just come and get a hold of me after we get done talking here. <laughs>